You might like to have your Bibles open at the passage from Luke. We're going to be having a think about that today. Also in your bulletin sheet, you'll find a sermon outline which tells you roughly where we're headed today, if if that's helpful as well. Let me pray for us as we come to think about this part of God's Word. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, thanks for gathering us today as your people. Thank you that you've inspired your Word by your Holy Spirit. Please work in us now by that same Spirit to understand who Jesus is and the significance that he has for our lives and the world we live in. In his name we pray it. Amen. Well, it is uh, great to be here with you again at St Peter's as we head towards Christmas. I'm not sure how you all get ready for Christmas at at your place, but at our home, uh, we, we start early in December, we put up a Christmas tree, the decorations come out, and so do nativity sets. I have to say, my wife loves nativity sets, and we've got three. I'll just put them up, I think, or maybe I won't. Is that working there? It is. Here's the nativity sets that are kind of around our house. They sit on various tables and shelves. The other day, uh, Jen brought home a fourth one, which now hangs across a window as well. It's made of felt. It's very, very pretty. The characters in all four sets are pretty much the same. You've got Mary, Joseph, the baby Jesus. You've got uh, a manger, three wise men, a shepherd or two, an angel, generally a donkey, a sheep, and even a camel will make the cut. Now, I've got to say, I don't mind having four nativity sets around our place because it reminds us of what we're thinking about as we come to Christmas. In the busyness and the distractions that are all around us at Christmas time, nativity sets take us back to the reason for the season, which of course is the birth of Jesus. However, the passage before us today uh, from Luke 1, 26 to 38, goes back before the nativity scene unfolded. And and it got me thinking as I looked at this passage about whether there might be a market for pre-nativity sets. Uh, What figures might a pre-nativity set have in it? Well, perhaps a six-month pregnant old woman called Elizabeth with her uh, husband, Zechariah, waiting for the birth of John the Baptist. Maybe an angel delivering a message to a a young virgin named Mary. Uh, Perhaps Mary, you'd have her there looking frightened, probably puzzled. You might even have a a very angry Joseph going crazy because he's discovered his fiancée is pregnant. As I read the pre-nativity counts in the Gospel, I definitely think there's potential for pre-nativity sets. And if someone did produce one, it would do us a great service because it would draw attention to a part of the story that's worth carefully considering if we're going to understand the significance of Jesus' birth in the much bigger picture. His story, of course, started before he was born with a visit by the angel to a young woman named Mary. Look with me again at Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. Now, I have never encountered an angel, though I know people who have. I haven't. But just imagine if you were Mary, what would you make of this? How would you feel? Uh, Probably surprised, uh, maybe scared. Look with me at how Mary Mary reacted in verse 29. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. That much perplexed uh, makes sense as well, doesn't it? But even more so when she hears the message. Look at it with me, verse 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. So Mary... Still a virgin is given the news that she'll become pregnant and give birth to a son who she's to call Jesus. Now she's not only troubled, but she's also confused. In verse 34, she asks the obvious question, How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, 
And the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. When the angel says the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, he's using the same language, almost the same language as you find in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, which tells us that before creation, the Spirit hovered over the waters. Mary, the angel, is saying, this is no ordinary son. This son comes by the Holy Spirit. This son comes by the power of the God who created the world. This is the Son of God himself. He concludes uh, in verses 36 and 37 with these words, And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Did you hear that? Nothing will be impossible with God. So you've got Elizabeth, who's an old woman, long past childbearing age, she conceives. And then you've got Mary, a young virgin, conceiving without having sex with a man. Both of these are an impossibility according to the usual laws of nature, aren't they? And yet the impossible is made possible by the power of God the Holy Spirit. The same spirit who came over the waters when God spoke the words that led to the miracle of creation would now come over Mary and cause the miracle of a virgin conceiving and bringing forth a child. Well, it's pretty full-on information. This is a very unusual message indeed. Just imagine trying to process this as a teenage girl. But you'd be thinking, surely this can't be. So I'm not married never had sex, you say you're going to have a baby. But actually, that's not at all how Mary responded. Look with me at verse 38. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Mary truly is a remarkable young woman, don't you think? I mean, here am I, the servant of the Lord. She takes the message on board. She simply trusts God. Let it be with me according to your word. This is an incredibly calm response. Most people, I think, would be kind of thinking, that you know, this is terrible. Uh, how am I going to tell my parents? Uh, what are they going to say? Will they believe me? What about my fiancé? How's he going to handle it? But not Mary. She calmly takes it on board and says, essentially, your will be done with me, Lord. She truly is remarkable. Because, let's face it, this is out there stuff. Uh, When you stop and think about it, the pre-nativity scene is very strange indeed. Could it possibly be true that the eternal Son of God would take on frail human flesh and enter this world through the the womb of a virgin. Not long ago, I came across an excellent little book called Is Christmas Unbelievable? Uh, It's written by Rebecca McLaughlin, who is one of the best Christian apologists around at the moment. But in this book, she has a chapter entitled How Can You Believe in the Virgin Birth? Let me just read to you from the book briefly. I don't believe that. I had just read my then four-year-old the account in Luke's Gospel of an angel telling Mary that the Holy Spirit was going to impregnate her with a baby who would be God's own son. As there were multiple unbelievable elements in the story, I gently probed to figure out which part she didn't believe. It turned out it was the angel. She was old enough to not believe in the tooth fairy, so surely angels were made up too. I got her scepticism. For many of us, the angel is the fairy on top of the Christmas tree of implausibility. A virgin birth, wise men guided by a star, it seems the stuff of fairy tales. But in this chapter, I want to suggest that these strange-sounding supernatural claims should not be dismissed, because if there is a God who made the universe, it's quite rational to believe the Christmas miracles. In fact, it will be irrational to discount them. Did you hear that last statement? 
If there is a God who made the universe, it is quite rational to believe the Christmas miracles. In fact, it would be irrational to discount them. I've got to say, uh, that's a pretty helpful book. Uh, if you're already a follower of Jesus, this will help you to remember that Christian faith has a solid basis, both historically and rationally. Um, if you're not yet a Christian, and maybe you're still a bit sceptical, this would be a great book for you. Or if you've got a, a, a person who you love, who you'd love to come to know Jesus, this might be a good book to give them in the lead up to Christmas as well. Uh, hopefully it'll be, be a helpful one. The good news is I have about 12 copies um, on a little table out here. I think Kurong has some as well. But they'll be there outside the door as you leave if you'd like one. Just consider that a Christmas gift. A lot of them went this morning. I should have ordered 50, Emily. We, we, a lot of them went at the early service. But if you get out there early, you could get one as well. Friends, what I'm saying is the virgin birth is just one of the supernatural events that accompanied the arrival of Jesus. Angels, guiding stars, virgin births, none of these things are ordinary. But then Jesus wasn't ordinary either. Let's just backtrack now to verse 32 and consider what the angel Gabriel says to, to Mary about Jesus. Verse 32, the angel said, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now notice four extraordinary things to learn here about the son to be born to Mary. Firstly, he would be a king who fulfill, fulfilled the promises made to David. Way back in Samuel 2, 2, Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, promises were made by God to King David about a descendant who would come from his line. A perfect king. Mary's son would be that king. Secondly, he would be a king who was the son of God. King David and his dynasty were called sons of God, but Mary's son would have a deep eternal relationship with God his father. Thirdly, Mary's son would be a king with absolute power. He would be a son of the Most High with all of the authority of his all-powerful heavenly father. And fourthly, Mary's son would be a king whose reign would never end. Uh, our problem is that bad governments often go on too long and good governments don't last, but this king's reign would last forever. Can you see, this was no ordinary birth and no ordinary child. Indeed, everything about Jesus was extraordinary. Uh, his miraculous birth, his incredible life, his sacrificial death, his marvellous resurrection. At every point, Jesus was extraordinary. The pre-nativity scene predicted it. The birth, life, death and resurrection of Jesus confirmed it. And the impact of who Jesus is and what he's done continue to be felt to this very day. I've just uh, started reading a book called Dominion. Uh, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. It's by Tom Holland. It's a popular history book that's made the Sunday uh, Times bestseller list. Now, in this book, Holland argues that our modern world has been profoundly shaped by the consequences of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. He concludes that the Christian faith has provided the most influential framework for making sense of human existence ever. Now, Tom Holland is not a Christian, by the way. But what he says doesn't surprise me in light of what I read about Jesus in the Bible and particularly in light of what we've seen in the passage before us today. The message given by the angel to Mary over 2,000 years ago was a message of tremendous comfort and reassurance. It meant God had not forgotten his promises the promises made to his people some 1,000 years earlier. The child to be born to the Virgin Mary would be the Son of God, the perfect, all-powerful and eternal King. It was a message of hope back then, 
but it continues to be a message of hope today. You know, we live in a world that feels a deep need for hope, but it isn't really sure about what hope actually means or, or where it can be found. Um, I don't know whether you saw the uh, Good Weekend magazine uh, this last weekend, um, but there was a lead article entitled Holding On To Hope At The End Of A Hard Year. And uh, in it, the author was searching for inspiration to hope in spite of a year that saw terrible things happen. <laughs> in spite of a year where we had massive, massive earthquakes in Turkey, Syria and Morocco, where we had uh, uh, scorching temperatures and wildfires, as well as, fl as floods. A year that saw thousands of people killed in wars, both in the Ukraine and in the Middle East. And having ruminated on the problem of human suffering without any real answers, the author then reflects on the things he hoped for. And then he goes to Facebook to ask other people to share what they hope for. And the responses that made the cover for the Good Weekend were these. I hope the cancer doesn't come back. Uh, I hope I meet my grandchildren. I hope Alan starts using deodorant again. <laughs> I hope for a romantic love, simple and kind. I hope for the death of religious faith and certainty. I hope for truly political, truly courageous political leaders. I hope for just a few moments of quiet. I hope to keep hope alive. Now, I found that an interesting collection of answers. And I can imagine some came from busy mothers, others from people struggling with health issues, some from people with deep yearnings for love and peace, others from people who see religion as more of a problem than a solution. But how might you have answered the question, what do you hope for? As God's people, what do we hope for? Back in Mary's day, they hoped for the arrival of the long-awaited king descended from David, the king who would come and rescue his people and rule righteously forever. Perhaps this is why Mary responded as positively as she did, let it be to me according to your word. But not everything would have made sense to Mary at that moment. Yet even in what she didn't understand, she was willing to trust and obey. Today, as we look back in the light of the scriptures, we understand that Jesus came to earth the first time to live the perfect human life, die the perfect sacrificial death. Through his death and his resurrection, Jesus paid the price for human sin and so conquered sin and death. As we look back to the cross and the empty tomb, we discover the joy of forgiveness and also the certain hope of eternal life through faith in him. But today, we also look forward to something else. We look forward, don't we, to the second coming of Jesus. Because of the historical reality of the first coming of Jesus, as Christians, our certain hope is that he will come again. In Luke's second volume, the book of Acts, chapter 17, we read this. God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this by raising him from the dead. Friends, this is not a hollow hope. This is not a wish list hope that carries no certainty. No, this is a sure hope based on the reality of the events in human history and the promise of God's word, which is just as certain for us now as it was for Mary back then. Brothers and sisters, just as surely as Jesus came the first time, he will come again a second time. And on that day, he will come in glory to judge the living and the dead. On that day, all human evil will be brought to account and those who've accepted Jesus as Saviour and Lord will be reunited with God's people all down through the ages. On the day of Christ's return, all who have trusted in him will enjoy a new resurrection reality, a new heaven, a new earth, an eternal dwelling place with God where we will be his people 
and God himself will be our God. Revelation 21 describes it beautifully like this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Brothers and sisters, this is our future. This is our certain hope. And this is what enables us to persevere rather than despair in the face of suffering and uncertainty. Yes, in the words of the uh, Good Weekend author, the earth is screaming and we along with her. But the promises of God's word stand firm, just as they did for Mary. And so we do well to follow her example of willing trust and obedience to the will of God, even when we don't fully understand how he's working out his purposes in human history. When we experience a sense of doubt about the promises of God, when we feel a sense of frustration that his plan seems slow to unfold, when we find ourselves wondering, will Jesus ever return? We do well to consider the words that Elizabeth said of Mary a little later in the same chapter we've been looking at today. She said this, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfilment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Blessed is she, and blessed will you and I be when we believe that the promises of God in his word will be fulfilled still. The true people of, the old, of God in the Old Testament were those who waited for the first coming of the Messiah, according to the scriptures. The true people of God today are those who wait for the second coming of our Messiah, again, according to the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, let us wait with joyful hearts and certain hope, for the Lord Jesus will certainly come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Mary, you are truly God, and yet for our sake you also became truly human. Thank you for taking our human nature, living our life, dying our death and becoming our saviour. We praise you as our risen Lord and thank you that you have conquered sin and death, that we might know the joy of forgiveness and the certain hope of eternal life. Please help us, Lord Jesus, to live in the light of your promised return. Help us, like Mary, to trust in your word and yield our lives to you in the obedience of faith. For your glory alone. Amen.